It's Vala Ao with Dickie Chang, brought to you by Nesveta Tile, Kuhio Motors, BFI System, Kauai Lumber, Sumo's Restaurant, Ron's Puhi Paint, Kauai Realty, Hawaiian Creative Video, Maui Jim Sunglasses, and Custom Limo. Aloha Kauai and welcome to another edition of Vala Ao. I'm Dicky Chang. For our first stop today, we'll be heading to Anini Beach. Where we'll be catching up with some fast-paced, action-packed polo at its finest. In our Where Are They Now segment, we'll be chatting with a gentleman affectionately known as Uncle Tony, the very colorful yet sometimes controversial but highly lovable former mayor, Tony Kunimura. Now face it, many of us out there are looking for bargains in our final segment We'll be visiting with many of these bargain hunters, as well as some wheelers and dealers at the Kapa'a Sunshine Market. So why don't you sit in your favorite chair, grab your favorite beverage, well for that matter, grab your favorite beverage, and then sit in your favorite chair so you don't have to sit up twice. Vala'au will be right back after some words from our sponsors. <laughs> Check out the chairs over there. Now, check the weaves. Whoa, it's time for with Dickie Chang. Whoa! 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 We were graciously welcomed into the home of Glenn Maderis, Kauai's international recording and performing star. So we finally caught up with you, Glenn. Tell us uh, what you've been up to. Uh, I've just been keeping myself real busy. I've been uh, working on music over here on Kauai. I've just uh, been uh, opening a studio, doing a whole bunch of stuff. Now. You were planning to go back to L.A. to work on your sixth album. Uh, unfortunately, as we all know, they were hit by the earthquake. How has that set you back, and have you been enjoying your additional time here in Kauai? Well, like you said, I originally planned to uh, go to Los Angeles and move there about uh, three or four months ago. But then when the earthquake came, I had to change my plans. Um, so um, I kind of made up my mind now to just uh, base myself here and there. Uh, once I go up to do my new album in in uh, in LA on in about two months or so, I'll uh, I'm gonna look for a place and just go back and forth in between there and here. Now the last time I was here at your residence, I had uh, took a look and got fond of one of the pictures, and that particular picture is one that we have in the background here. That picture is uh, uh, quite old. If you can elaborate a little bit about that. Oh yeah. Um, well the. The picture there is a, a picture of the first time I, that I was on stage, uh, and uh, it's I was singing in a play, and uh, I I still remember how nervous I was. The mic was just shaking, and it was um it was quite an experience for me. Uh, I'll never forget it. And uh, yeah, I keep the picture out now, and people laugh at it. But you know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was really young then. I was, I was about twelve. Yeah, because I noticed you had those white mesh shoes and a yep. uh, leather jacket. Was that somebody that influenced you, or was that the cool look back then when you were 12 years yeah, old? Everybody was wearing those mesh shoes at that time, and I think that was the only shoes that I had at that time. <laughs> but, but no, I had to wear the leather jacket. It was the part I was playing. Now, you say you were a little nervous. Now, four short years later, you then uh, entered the brown bags to start on contests. And I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that might have been the first year that it was uh, statewide. Uh, it was it was uh, one um, actually it wasn't the first year it was statewide but it uh, it it was a year when they were still televising it on TV which I think was very important or is very important for talent contests so that everyone can see what's going on and um, I I was very lucky I entered the contest and um, 
I was in the contest with a lot of talented people, and uh, I got, I just, I ended up winning the state championship, which was a, uh, which was a dream of mine ever since I had been watching the the uh, Brown Bags to Stardom contest on TV. That's pretty incredible. And from there, um, at 16 years old, did you know at that time your career was going to turn into music and as successfully as you've become? I I knew. Inside, I felt that I had the talent to to possibly make it, but I I didn't know really how to get to the to that level to to get to that point. Actually, I didn't I didn't know, and I was trying to associate myself with uh, people who may have known you know how to get there, but there wasn't any too many people here in Hawaii who really I think really knew what it took to get there. I mean it, what you know, what things you have to do with your talent to get there. Now, at that particular point, did you then find an agent? And for that matter, is that agent the same agent that's representing you now? Well, I, I got very lucky. I was talking to a few people, worked with a few people in Hawaii, but <clears throat> no one really could uh, do what I wanted, which was I, I felt that I needed to get um, myself in the studio do a song and have that song sent to people from the major record labels who could and try and get a major record uh, label you know to to sign a deal with me i that's what i wanted to happen except i didn't know how to get there when i did nothing's going to change my love for you um at the brown bags to stardom contest the winner of the contest was entitled to do a song so i got a song in the studio so i got a chance to go into the studio I went into the studio, did Nothing's Gonna Change My Love For You, um, started getting record, started getting play on the radio stations here, and uh, at that particular time when it was getting played, a program director from Phoenix, Arizona was vacationing here, heard the song, liked it, said, oh, you know what, I'm gonna play it on my radio station in Phoenix. So he went, he took it, played it in Phoenix. It became a number one uh, song on request in the, at that Phoenix radio station. At the same time, uh, my, my manager now, who is Lenny Silver, was vacationing there in Phoenix, heard that it was a number one song on the radio, but it was not available in the stores. He owns a record label, so he got in touch with me. I signed to his record label, and then together we signed to a major record label. So that's what happened. Now, was that at a young age of sweet 16? Yeah, 16 years old. Now, for the record right now, can you tell our viewing audience how old you are? I'm 23 now. And you've been in this business for eight years? Yeah, eight years. Now, Nothing's Gonna Change My Love For You had, had eventually become an international hit. Um, yes, it, uh, we, we recorded the song, we re-recorded the song. Uh, and uh, we later, uh, the first deal that I got with a major record label was for every country outside of the United States. It wasn't a United States deal. It was a deal for every country outside of the United States. And um, so the first place it was released in, I remember, was Norway. We had a number one song there. And then all of a sudden, it just started, it started just going out throughout the whole world and it had a number one song in Norway, Sweden, France, Germany and it just kept hitting and hitting and hitting and from that point on I continued making albums and releasing songs but that was um, that was the first place that actually I had any success. It was in Europe. Um, it was later released in the United States a little bit later uh, under an independent record label and because I, I still couldn't get a major record deal in the United States yet even with that song. Um, and it went it in the United States. It went up to number eleven on the charts, and um, and then after after all of that, about a year later, I got a deal with MCA Records in the United States. So I, um, right right now, I still have those same deals. I have uh, I have a deal with Polygram Records for everywhere outside the United States, and then for in the United States itself, I have a separate deal. Why was it that you couldn't get a deal in the United States? What's the difference between doing a record internationally and doing one in America? Well, every market, every country is different. The type of music that they listen to, the kind of artist uh, that they, they listen to. Um, I just so happen, according to the record executives in the United States, didn't fit uh, the kind of mold that they wanted. 
and um, or the type of music that I was doing wasn't right, they felt, for the United States. Um, and, and basically, that's what it was. Um, in the music business, I don't think it's so much how good your music is or, or what kind of music that you do. I think in the music business, it's all who you know, really. I mean, if you know someone in there, they can get you a record deal. Um, so um, it's sad to say that it's that way, but it, I think at this point right now, in most cases, it is. I don't. There's not a lot of people in the music industry that are music minded. Uh, I think most of the people in the music industry are business minded, and then they're not music minded. Yeah. So, like many other businesses, including the music industry, sometimes it might not necessarily be what you know is, but who you know. Yeah, it's true. It's who you know, and that, and my, and to me, I I wouldn't tell somebody, oh, you know, you should be going out there and. And you know, and making friends with people that you don't want to make friends with, but you're only doing it because of you know what you want out of your entertainment career or singing, whatever. But I, I still feel if you can find uh, people out there who can who can make the right moves for you, who has a good head on their shoulders, um, you can. Um, you're putting yourself in a much better situation. The only problem is you don't know what the music business is like. Uh, until you've been in it. So there's a lot of people out there who, who have been entertainers and so forth who end up becoming managers because they know about the business. But what they do is they take advantage of a lot of young singers who really don't know anything about the music industry. And, and that's where it c causes a lot of problems for a lot of people. Um, what I try to do is take my experience that I've had in the last eight years and whoever I meet, I try to tell them what the music industry is like, what to watch out for, and so forth. Um, because it's, very, it's, it's a very, very bad situation in the music industry when it comes to stuff like that. And in, in a lot of different businesses, really. But especially in the music industry, I've seen a lot of people you know, get, get themselves in a lot of bad situations. Now, at a very young age of 16, 17, or 18, you were still basically in school, be it a junior or a senior at Kauai High School. Now, when all of this attention was going through you, and you're on this little island and basically going to school locally here on Kauai, mm -hmm. what kind of impact did that, they, did that have on your life, your family's life, or for that matter, your friends in the school? Well, what ended up happening was that I... I was not going to school as often. Um, I was on the road quite a bit, um, either on tour or on promotional tours. I, my friends were, a lot of my friends were, didn't really know what was going on with me because they didn't really see anything happening when I was in high school. You know, they didn't know that I, I had the number one songs and the gold records and the, and the, and all the different things that I was, you know, um, doing shows for 20,000 people for, you know, nobody really knew. So they still treated me pretty much the same. It's just that they knew that they, the, the only thing they knew is that I, I was, you know, leaving for three weeks at a time, you know, or a month at a time. So, you know. Is it pretty safe to say that maybe at that particular age you never really knew what was going on also with your life oh. being being you 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 played um, in front of uh you know w within 20 to 30 different countries with an entourage always or many times upwards to 60 different people be it sound technicians bodyguards uh, managers mm -hmm. uh fellow band members musicians mm -hmm. uh and on top of that in front of you know over 20,000 screaming fans in different types of countries i mean what was that feeling for you, being a very, very young man, for that matter, a teenager? It was, I never took it, you know, I never concentrated on things like that. I mean, although it was, it's, when you think about it and you look at it from the outside, you go, wow, that's pretty overwhelming for someone, you know, it's a, it's a pretty overwhelming experience for somebody, especially somebody who's really young. But for me, I, 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 I took it in stride when I was young. I just, I said, okay, this is part of the deal. You know, I've had some success. This is part of it. I'm going to try to make the most of it, you know, and just have a good time and and have fun and make music and enjoy myself. And uh, I never really thought about 
you know, as we get older as individuals, I think um, that's where uh, uh, we start needing to, you know, nurture our our egos. And, and when I was young, uh, egos, uh, ego, my was n was not even in my vocabulary. I mean, I did. I, I was. I just wanted to have fun and go out there, and I I wasn't going out there proving something to people. So, it didn't affect or wanting to prove something to people. It didn't affect my mind or anything. I just was out there just having fun, you know, doing what I enjoy. Well, quite frankly, you know, quite honestly, of all the success that you have, you know, the, the many things that your family, for that matter, your friends and everybody that knows you here in Kauai will say that that's something that you've never obtained was an ego. And that's, uh, you know, that's very hard to come by being with all the different type of people that you met and all of your different travels. Um, how do you attribute that? Well... I mean, I, I think everybody has their positives and negatives, and I have my negatives. But I've always tried, I, I've always looked at other people out there, and I've seen them, you know, trying to make sure that their ego, uh, to, that, they're, that they were looked at at a certain level. And what I realized is that everybody has their own opinion, and uh, what really makes a difference is your opinion of your, yourself. If, if you, so I'm not going to go out and try and prove it to other people. What I'm going to do is, I, I mean, some people who are close to me may think that I'm egotistical, but I'm not the kind of egotistical person that will show it to others. I'm not going to do things to show it plainly that I'm egotistical or say things. But inside, I really believe in what I can do. There are certain things that I, I feel that I can do better. But I believe in myself to a certain point, because if I don't believe in myself, um, I'm not getting. I'm not going to get anywhere. But so I do believe in myself, and I do. I, and without that, I I don't. I feel that I can't get. Uh, I can't be c continually become a better person. But I don't. I'm not the kind of person that goes out and shows it. You know, and uh, by the things I say and what I do. If if what I do makes people think that I'm a good musician or a good singer, then that's fine. You know. But I'm not going to go out and purposely try and do something just, just so that I, I, I'm going to see other people saying, hey, you know, he's good, you know. Don't touch that dial. Vala will be right back with more with Glenn Madaris. Start from the beginning. Glenn, how old are you? You're 14, you're 13 now? I'm 20. You're, you're 20? 20. You're 20. Good. <laughs> you look so young. I think my last video, She Ain't Worth It, was an introduction and saying, okay, I'm doing something with Bobby Brown, and he's introducing me into the music business. We ended up planning um, very quickly because the single just bursted into the charts in its first week at number 50 and we had Bobby Brown in the video and there was me and there was the dancers and the girls and they showed a little bit of Bobby which was surprising they showed a little bit of me and it's like people are wondering after the video who is that and that's what we wanted. With a warm and helpful staff on hand, Kauai Lumber at the Lawai Cannery is ready to fill all your home care needs. Womanized framing lumber, prime trim from Georgia Pacific, windows from Milgard, and hardware from Simpson. As one of the main suppliers of Kiahuna Plantation, we also offer customized services like container shipments, special orders, and job site delivery. Reduce your maintenance concerns with prime trim from Georgia Pacific. At Kauai Lumber, supplying the needs of Kauai with quality materials is our main priority. Hi, I'm Ed. And I'm Ed. And when we're done with the afternoon luau, we watch Vala Ao with Dickie Chang on Channel 6 Kauai Cable Vision. And Channel 7 Garden Island Cable Vision. You know which one I'm talking about. Vala Ao. Vala Ao. Vala Ao. Vala Ao. You know, many of your fans and the followers out there would, would, would really want to know who has actually set an inspiration to you, or was there anyone um, very influential as to uh, the success of Glenn Madaris? Well, I, I think some of it has to come down 
I mean, the root of it has to come down to my family. I, I, when I was growing up, I spent a lot of time at home with my family. We were very close. Uh, we, every day, I st we'd take out the record player. We'd be singing and dancing. My mom would be singing with us. And that was, that was the beginnings. And that was the beginnings of my inspiration. Um, I grew up listening to many different singers. I, my favorite singer when I was growing up was Elvis. I mean, I loved everything about him, the way he looked, the way he moved, walked, talked, danced. I got older and my music inspirations, I used to um, listen to a lot of Holland Oates and I used to listen to Michael Jackson and, and I used to listen to a lot of Barry Manilow. I used to listen to a lot of, um, uh, a lot of love songs, Air Supply and, and but that was kind of good actually for me. I listened to many different types of music because in, uh, in, um, it helped me to become a more well-rounded uh, uh, individual musically. Uh, in Hawaii, we have so many different types of music, as you all know. I mean, you have you know you have the uh, and the different races here and so forth. And I grew up listening to kachi kachi music, and I, and then there was you know the the you go to the bon bon dances and you get you know the Japanese music and everything, and all that together will help. You know, um, it has helped me. You know, and in Hawaii we listen to rap, we listen to rock, we listen to Hawaiian, Hawaiian, you know everything, and uh, so. Growing up in Hawaii was a good foundation for me as a musician, I think. It's pretty um, unique to hear the musicians that have been influential to you, especially because of the fact that most of the artists that you talk about, be it Air Supply, Daryl Hollow, John Oates, uh, Barry Matalo, Elvis, pretty much uh, is in my era. And, mm -hmm. I, and I don't really want to date myself, but I think a lot of people can pretty much relate to that type of music, music of the latter 60s, the early 70s, you know, maybe the later part of the 70s. And at that particular time, you may not have even been 11 or 12 years old. Yeah, I was, I, at this point right now in my life, I listen to stuff that, I mean, from way back, I, the more music that I listen to, the more information is in my mind and the more... I can open up myself as a musician. And that's the one thing I could tell, um, I, sh I would like to say to everyone out there is, if you're a musician, I, I had, a, when I was really young, I had a tendency to listen to, like, although there were different types of music, I, I would only listen to like maybe, uh, maybe 10 different singers. And I listen to them every day. But now I listen to stuff that I don't even like sometimes, but I listen to it and I go, okay, and I, and I pick up from it, and it helps me. It helps me. So I listen to as much music as I can, and that would be the best advice I can give to anyone who's young, who's really trying to develop their talents. Listen, listen. That's a that's the best tool you have. You know, your ears. So you have to listen and and pick up from that. That's incredible because actually, based on your natural love for music, um, there is also a business side to it as far as success is concerned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there is a business side. And um, what I've learned is from when I take a look at all the musicians out there uh, who have made it, what I find is that the ones, most of them who have made it out there have found that medium between taking their art and, and taking that to a, a really high level, but then also taking their business sense to a certain level. I mean, a lot of people use uh, Madonna as a, an example. I mean, she she took her, she went and did music that nobody else was doing with a style that nobody else was doing, and she was offering people a style of music that that was original, and and an image and uh, I mean uh, musically, and that was original. And then she took a business side and put her image together that was original and worked together with that music. It's it's like she actually sat down and really put a lot of thought into it and and she went and she did it and you know became successful i mean uh, i guess some people don't really put any thought into it it just is a natural thing but um i think most people out there do sit down and really think about what they are going to do and that so i i have to be business minded to a certain point i have to because my goal is so that people can hear my music. That's what I want. I want people to be able to hear my music. I want to one day, I've, when I pass away, 
I have something that people can listen to, you know, on and on, and and I don't, and I so I want people to be able to hear my music. So you have to have that business, you know, sense too. You know, I I was at your studio and I noticed a couple faxes coming through, and actually some of them was a, a love letter from a little Spanish gal that I believe lived in Massachusetts, <laughs> and there were about two letters that was out. But I understand. Uh, during your, your peak, if I may uh, use that word, being at 17, 18, or 19 years old, you used to have like about 200 f fan mail a day. Yeah, I used to have a bunch of mail coming in every day. And um, they would come, some of them would come to my home, some of them would go to the, um, you know, the fan club in New York. But uh, there was a lot of mail coming in, and, uh, and I used to try and get to some of them, but I never, um, I could never answer everyone back but I would I would try and get to s at least some of them and then the people at the fan club would try and pick out you know the the letters that you know were were most interesting and, and give those to me were those letters that be most interesting was strictly from females or <laughs> everyone in general <laughs> most of them were girls most of them were girls but uh, there were there were um, there were some guys I mean I would say maybe like 20 percent maybe <laughs> yeah well, I know a lot of guys here on Kauai that would love to have that 80% that was from the female, so we could write them or give them a call. But um, you still have that fan club that's uh, active right now? Well, what happens is when I do an album, we open it up, and then when, when, I, when I, there's always a period of waiting time between the albums. Um, then we close it down, and then we open it back up. So it'll probably open back up when this next record's uh, done. So it's just, it's just that we need a lot of people. There's, we have to hire a lot of people when, when we have it open, people who will write the newsletters, who will you know, do things like that. I'm not the, at the point of popularity where I can be constantly doing that, you know, you know, 365 days a year, you know. But um, so I do it on and off, and, you know. So s some people say sometimes, oh, I wrote to your fan club, but they didn't answer back to me. Well, if they write back, if they buy the record when, when it, you know, after it was released for a while, then that'll happen, which is sad, but, you know, it's just the way it's got to be, you know, right now. It's showbiz, though. Yeah. <laughs> what do you do as far as hobbies are concerned? Well, music is not only my job, but it's a hobby for me. So I spend a lot of time doing music. Um, I spend a lot of time with my family and my friends. I, I'll go out, we'll go out, watch a movie. We'll, um, we'll go to the beach, you know, nothing, nothing, uh, nothing major. I like to play tennis. Um, I, sometimes I play golf with my, with my uh, father. He loves to play golf a lot. Um, just pretty much what everybody else, do, you know, does here, you know. So there's not too much to do <laughs> here. So, <laughs> but uh, but I try to keep. Uh, but that's what kind of what I like about Kauai too, though. That is so laid back and relaxed, because that's the kind of person I am. Now, many people uh, across the country or different parts of the world all wonder if you do have a girlfriend. I understand you do for actually quite some time. You want to tell us a little about about her? Yeah. Um. Her her name is uh, Nikki, and uh, I. I've uh, been going with her for now uh, altogether about eight years now. Uh, we met in high school, and uh, it's uh, uh, we we've been together for a while, and it's been a great relationship. You know, um, she's always supported me in that, and uh, I think that's kind of hard to find with most musicians, because you know um, whether it's support from your family or your friends. And I got a lot of support from her, and, uh, and she's been great. Is there anything out there that you want to talk to and say to the people of Kauai who's been so supportive in your career and uh, your uh, livelihood here on Kauai? I would just like to say that I had a lot of support from people on Kauai when I was starting out. Um, there were some people who, who, who really didn't want to see me happen uh, as, a, as a singer. Um, but to those people who did support me, and uh, I, my heart goes out. You know, my heart goes out to you. Um, I've I've really had a great, great life up to this point, and I hope that with the experience that I have, I can teach other people here on Kauai um, what what it is like to be in the business, and hopefully guard them from anything 
um, that may happen in in the future. I I like to help others. I really I really would like to do that because I know I know what it's like to be in that situation, and I think with the experience that I have now, I can help uh, uh, people who from from getting into bad situations. You know, before we take off to the studio, you had mentioned very shortly about Madonna. Um, have you met her, or for that matter, who who are some of the celebrities you've met throughout your uh, career? I've never met Madonna, but I have uh, I have met quite a few people. Um, the one that comes to mind first is Prince. I, I was working in a, a studio in Minneapolis, in his studio, and uh, I was working with uh, the Jets. We were doing a song together for a soundtrack uh, for the Karate Kid 3 soundtrack. And so we were doing the song together, and um, I, I walked out of the studio. I didn't know Prince was in the studio. So I knew he owned it, but I didn't know he was there. And I walked out, and there was a lot, there, there's a, like a lobby area. Uh, and, and, and all of a sudden, I saw this guy, and he was eating Doritos, and he was watching television. And I was like, and for a split second, I thought, oh, that looks kind of like Prince. And then I thought to myself, oh my god, it could be. So I moved. I walked up. and. And I just saw him, and I, I just stared. I was like in complete shock, you know. And I was just, you know, I just stopped and I looked at him, and and he looked at me, and I was so scared that I just walked away. <laughs> I couldn't even go up to him and talk to him. I mean, I was, I was completely frightened. But it was neat to at least see him. But that was the only time that it happened to me. I met people like, um, I mean, I worked with Bobby Brown. We're, we're good friends, uh, and Paula Abdul. I we. We 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 spent a lot of time um, uh, together, and she she met Nikki, and and we we used to eat breakfast together, had fun, met um, gosh, so many people along the way. Um, um, I worked a lot with Ray Parker Jr. Um, I did some records with him. Uh, just so many different groups out there. I would have to go on and on, but. The Prince situation was the only situation where I actually I couldn't even go up to him because I was so stoked. <laughs> I wish I had that kind of reception when uh, you greeted uh, me at the door, uh, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so have any of these celebrities come to Kauai and actually visit you on Kauai? Um, or for that matter, do they know that you... It, I'm sure many of them know that you're from Hawaii, but do they know that you're from the Garden Island of Kauai? Well, there, uh, there is actually... Um, Maybe I would say a good like ten to fifteen people a year who come up and they they'll look for my house and then they'll ask people and then they'll find and they'll knock on the door. Some of them will like give presents and this, they'll say some of them will come from Europe just just to come down and just to meet me for a little while and talk with me. And uh, and I personally I think that's kind of crazy. I mean to come you know all the way down here just to you know. Just to talk with me for a little while, but some of them do, and and you know, and I talk to them. I try not to, you know, brush them off, you know. But um, sometimes certain people they go overboard and they'll they'll keep coming by, coming by, coming by. After I spent, you know, maybe a little while talking to them, I, I wish that I could become friends with everyone who who wants to meet me. But at the same time, I I have to, you know, I have my life to attend to and my life to live and. And I, I, I can't be doing that, you know. So I, I just try to be friendly and, and, and you know, and make it worth their, you know, trip to come down and just you know, talk to them, maybe sign some pictures and stuff like that. Well, what you could do the easy way out is you could probably um, put them on one of your number one fan, your dad Robert's tour. He, oh, gi yeah. <laughs> he gives one of the best uh, uh, Waimea Canyon uh, Fern Grotto tour here on the island. Yeah, he's good. He's really good. I, um, he's uh. Um, I, I when when I was growing up, I went on him with a, uh, with him on a couple of tours, and um, sometimes I I used to go on and and I used to watch him. And I when I was growing up, I wanted to be a tour guide. I was like, yeah, this is a cool job. He's really good at it. And uh, right now, I might stay away from doing that. But <laughs> but uh, it was uh, oh, sometimes I used to go and sing with him. Uh, he would he would sing on the bus too. He'd be singing to people and sing all the 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 local songs and the tourists would sing along in the bus and and uh, sometimes I used to go on that on the little uh, mic on the, on the bus and, and and sing for people too and and uh, and uh, and sometimes they they walk out of the bus and I they just give me money I mean I like fifty dollars or one dollar bills 
<laughs> so I used to, I used to always want to go with him on the tour, but, uh, but, uh, to be with your dad or for the fifty dollars of one dollar bill. That's a hard one. <laughs> that's a hard one. You know, um, ironically, I saw your dad yesterday at the airport, and I talked to your dad excitedly about the fact that we were going to do a little interview. And for everyone out there, um, I just want to put in my two cents worth because Glenn is a very, very original man, and he's very, very humble, very, very considerate, and that's the. Uh, message that I conveyed to your dad and I know that that's blood and I know that your dad is always going to be a father but you know the one thing that he told me that really touched him was he himself was equally impressed and for the life of him he couldn't realize how you could be so mellow and so humble and I think uh, you know with that I think we should uh, you know pass down our kudos to both your mom and dad especially your brothers and sisters yeah I have a, I'm lucky I have a good family I mean we are we're close. We we spend a lot of time together, and and we support each other. So they, I never really had the problems. Like um, I know some other entertainers, uh, I, when I talk to them personally, have had the problems of, you know, jealousy within brothers, sisters, and so forth. And and never had that problem. And when it came to my parents and supporting me for what I do, um, they said, you know, hey, you do whatever you want in life. We'll we'll support you. You know, as long as it's nothing, you know, awful. But you know, um, you know, um, they, I could do pretty much anything I wanted to. So that was that was nice. So those friends, those brothers and sisters that you talk about, or families uh, that might have animosity to one another, might not uh, be the Jacksons by any chance. Huh? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's a, that's a sad situation right there. But but. Again, we. Uh, one thing that I've learned from from the industry is that, w with when it comes to the press, a lot of the time, you you're not really seeing the real story. So when I take a look at stuff like that, I say, yeah, there may be a lot of truth to it, but at the same time, you have to look at it and say, hey, there there might not be either. So, you kind of I kind of I try not to to lean towards one side. You know, I just try to look at both and say, okay, you know. But in that particular case, it, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Glenn, with all your travels, are you conscious to the fact that you are literally uh, a true will ambassador for Kauai? I can't. That torch, I think, was kind of handed to me when I became um, an international artist. People would constantly say to me, "Oh, are you from Hawaii?" Uh, that's what I. That's what I heard in the interview. Um, uh, what island are you from? And I'll say, oh, I'm from Kauai, and and they'll say, oh, um, oh, I've never been there. Most of most people say, oh, I've been to Oahu, and on Maui, but I've never been to Kauai. Some of the people who I talk to say that you know they've um, been to Kauai, and most of the people who have been to Kauai really like it, you know, a lot. Um, me as an ambassador, I I'm always trying to, you know, to to make sure that if people come to Hawaii to check out Kauai because Kauai is to me the most incredible place I mean I at least I've been to and I've been to quite a few places and 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 I and I realize also that how important the uh, tourist industry is to Hawaii and I know that there are some local people out there <coughs> who don't like the fact that oh holidays are coming or you know people are coming down to Hawaii but if they shouldn't think about it that way they should think hey what what better of a situation could you ask for I mean if you can get people to come to Hawaii spend their money and then leave to me that's the best situation possible so we should be supporting tourism I think I mean, with with all of with all of the might, with all of our might, and for me, it's been something that's been taking care of me my whole life. My father was a tour guide, and I think most of the people that I know that I grew up with who were making good money were making money because of the tourism industry. So um, I think it's something that we we should support, and I try to tell that to, you know, I try to sell Kauai to whoever I you know whoever I meet. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, take off to Glenn's studio and uh, see how he fiddles and faddles around in his studio and what's up uh, in the future with Glenn Maderas. Mahalo.
Hi, I'm Sumo's Restaurant. Welcome to Sumo's Restaurant. Hi, I'm Sumo's Restaurant. Welcome to Sumo's Restaurant. May I take your order? Hi, I'm Sumo's Restaurant. Welcome to Sumo's Restaurant. May I take your order? Hey, give me one porterhouse steak medium, one shrimp scampi, one teriyaki butterfish, I like one chicken katsu, one breaded calamari, and a Siamese special. And let me check out your kiki menu for my junior boy. Yes, I have a chef salad, a sumo burger, a large order of fries, and that cute guy behind the sushi bar. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner to Kui Grove Shopping Center. Hawaiian Creative Video. Offering a wide range of professional video production services. Specializing in weddings with many attractive packages to choose from. Hawaiian Creative Video is known for its creative editing and also offers quality tape duplication. So for your next wedding or special occasion, call the team of professionals, Hawaiian Creative Video. Welcome back to Vala Awan. For those of you who have just been joining us, uh, we're here with Glenn Maderas. And Glenn, we're in your studio. Tell us a little bit about uh, what's happening here. Well, um, at this moment, I'm building the studio. And uh, hopefully in about three weeks, it'll be complete. Um, the studio is called Glenn Maderas Enterprises. And uh, I think it all, uh, this studio was built basically for, for people on Kauai to have a chance to come and record. And, uh, you know, whether it's to do demos or... Um, to do any type of recording, you know, um, the studio will be available, and it'll be available at a good price. Now, when you say available at a good price, you've recorded uh, quite a lot in Los Angeles, for example, mm -hmm. or Honolulu. How would these rates compare to, like, say, for example, Los Angeles or Honolulu? Well, um, this the studio is nowhere near, um, you know, uh, as great as the studios in LA. But in LA, they charge three hundred dollars an hour, and um, on Oahu. They charge from usually about uh, seventy dollars to one hundred fifty dollars an hour. Where um, here we, I'm going to be charging thirty five dollars an hour, and and uh, I'm I'm really excited about it. Um, most of the things I'm going to be doing in here is commercial work. I, I need to keep myself a little bit busy, uh, a little busy when I'm here in Kauai instead of just uh, going to the beach every day or having fun or whatever it is. But um, also, I'm using the studio to to write the songs and, that I'm writing now, and 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 for you know so that I can write songs for other people and, and not only just myself, but you know others. As far as your your writing abilities, are you leaning more toward writing now or actually more toward performing? At this particular moment, um, my my writing is is what I'm leaning towards, but um, it seems like. My albums, I do like one album every two years, and I don't know exactly why we don't plan it that way, but it just happens that way. And I'll be working on my sixth album in about a month, and when I get, when I'm working on that record, I'll probably be concentrating more on the singing side. But at this moment, I'm in between records, and um, I'm concentrating more on the writing. Again, in your singing career, be it uh, you know three, four, five years ago, when you were basically at your peak. Mm -hmm. With as far as your writing skills is concerned, and more albums to come, uh, is there a, a very good chance? Is that a part of your goal to once again surge as a performer? I would like to perform. I mean, 
there are times when I I really feel like oh I miss the stage, but then there are times when I miss the freedom of you know being able to write and write whatever type of music that I like to. So uh, I like both, but I think writing is something for me that I can go and do and enjoy when I'm 50, 60, you know. So I I tend to lean more towards the writing side. So Glenn, if uh, we want to come over here and record a song, we can call Glenn Madaris uh, Enterprises at 245-5188. Yes, 5188. And... Uh, and if by some chance I'm not here, I, I will pick up my messages even if I'm in Los Angeles or somewhere else. So um, just uh, be patient and I will get back to you. And um, and uh, I, I hope that I can work with the people on Kauai because, you know, I think there's a lot of talent here. And, and, and uh, I just think that people don't have the opportunity to go into a recording studio, you know, one that they'll feel comfortable in, you know, one that that's, you know, that they, you know, they walk into a business area, go in the studio and do work, you know. When I was started singing here on Col um I mean, when I started singing about the age of seven or eight, I started looking for studios and and I re did some recording in a couple of people's homes, but I felt I felt a little uncomfortable, you know. And I th I want people to feel as comfortable as possible. I guess maybe for some of the aspiring uh, youngsters out there, maybe it's safe to say that some of them might be just a, a, a little intimidated because they followed your career. You know, as you mm -hmm. said uh, earlier in our uh, interview that when you met Prince, you were stoked, you know, mm -hmm. you couldn't, and then maybe a lot of uh, those kids will, maybe because they've looked up to you for so many years, maybe they might be uh, pretty nervous themselves when they meet you. I think at first they might be, but you know, um, um, I think after a few minutes they'll you know they'll relax and, and realize that you know we're all human <laughs> you know so um but I mean that's a good point some some people do come up to me and talk to me in a way that you can say you can see that they're really intimidated but but you know um um usually after they talk to me for a little while then that seems to pass well, Glenn, we really appreciate the time that you spent with us. Uh, we know very much so that you've been very, very busy, and I know that you've been working around the clock basically to, to write for your sixth album as well as to put your studio together. And uh, we all would like to thank you for spending the time with us. And this was uh, very, very informational, and I think the people out there of uh, Kauai will really enjoy the time that they spent with you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for taking your time, and you got a great show, and this is good for the people of Kauai. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Glenn. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. Be a part of Kauai's local style at Koloa's only sushi bar. Taisho features fresh island seafood and authentic Japanese sushi. Taisho is open evenings. At Kukui Grove Shopping Center, Sumo's Kauai's family choice for lunch and dinner. After dinner at Sumo's, what fun! Sing along Kauai style at Sumo's Karaoke Bar. Drop by for a nightcap. The fun-loving local spirit of karaoke at Sumo's. The tradition and respect for your happiness at Taisho in Kaloa. Hi, my name is Magic Lee, but if you really want to see some magic, watch Sticky Chang on Vala Ao. We're back! Glenn, tell us a little bit about uh, some of the equipment and the points of interest here of your studio. Well, um, I'll start off with the uh, modules here. The, these are um, modules that um, I use to either create effects or to create music. Um, this is right here is a sampler where we can sample uh, bits of music and then here's a, this is a keyboard module. And then uh, the, these are all different effects and so forth. This right here is the uh, master keyboard. Um, all the other keyboards in here are controlled by this one here. And um, I, what I usually do is I have a computer here. It's not right here right now, but the, the computer controls is the brain of the whole system here. It's called a, uh, it's a MIDI system, and um, it's uh, it's the latest in you know, music technology. Uh, it's been around for about ten years, but I mean it's what people have been using to create music now for for you know and without 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 having a, a huge studio that's totally soundproof. You don't need to record with a live band. We can reproduce sounds with this, with that, that sound with this. Uh, this right here is the mixing board. Um, it's a 32-channel Tascam board. 
that I purchased two years ago and uh, it, I really like it a lot, it works really well uh, you get a good sound out of it. It's a nice board for the kind of stuff that I want to do like commercial work and demos and stuff like that. This right here is a 16 uh, track analog tape machine that I use for recording so we could in essence record 16 channels of of music uh, going on at the same time which is just uh, quite a bit you know we can you can do a lot with that. Um, up here we have uh, we're building right now but uh, we're building it now but this is the uh, sound booth. The only thing that we need to s have soundproof is the uh, vocals yeah, because or anything that's that's um, audio and not digital. Everything that runs through my board and through that whole system is digital so I don't need it to uh, be, the, I don't need the place to be soundproof. It can go through wires but this, when you do vocals you need the place to be soundproof and this is what this is for. It's um, and uh, it it, uh, I think I'll do a really good job. Glenn, how did you learn the engineering aspects of all your machinery? I started working on it two years ago, um, but I was in the studio and I've been involved working in the studio for about eight years. So between those two, I've had the chance to you know learn at least the basics of of recording and get it to a point where I feel comfortable you know working in the studio. Well, we want to wish all the success to you. It looks like as if you're definitely on your way to a very good thing and a very helpful cause here uh, for many of the aspiring musicians here on Kauai. And we'd like to thank you for that. And with that, uh, we know you have a very, very busy schedule. And I just want to thank you for joining us here at Valaau and uh, letting the audience see another side of Glenn Madaris. Well, thank you very much for taking your time. Mahalo. Yeah.